Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Blue Origins, New Glen is now Old Glen because it's launched, right? It's good old Glenny. Congratulations to everybody at the company that worked hard at this. You have graditum ferocitored and fisty bumped. Uh, you deserve this. It really has been great to see the Blue Origin employees on social media just, you know, shouting out about you know how they're proud to have worked on this. So yeah, uh, this was a launch that was a long time coming. Indeed, we had a previous launch attempt earlier in the week, which was scrubbed, and we'll talk about why that happened. But this launch, it did actually finally go off after an interruption from a wayward boat that was on the range. Um, the launch itself, well, if you're looking at those numbers, it does appear to be moving rather slowly, and we'll talk about that. But it is one of the more beautiful launches. The initial uh, shots were overexposed compared to what some of the people on the ground sh uh, saw, but look at those Mark Diamonds. Look at the seven engines there. That is so darn pretty. Yes, seven BE4 engines doing their thing. And to be honest, this was not surprising. We have previously seen four uh, BE4 engines fly on Vulcan. I mean, I'm going to say it is a power move to test your engines on your competitor's rocket. It was a night launch, so we don't get to see much else other than the rocket engines and the telemetry, and then it disappears into the clouds. And at this point, as it disappears into the cloud, I look at the telemetry and say, oh, it's like a minute 20 into this launch, and it's still just going supersonic. This was not a slow, not a fast takeoff by any measure. The other thing you'll notice when looking at the telemetry is they're reporting altitudes in feet and speeds in miles per hour. So the speeds do look a lot slower, um, although they are actually objectively slower than Falcon 9 at this stage in the flight. Falcon 9 gets supersonic after about 50 seconds. That's a full 30 seconds faster than New Glenn. And I think Falcon Heavy probably does it even faster than that. And to be fair, Falcon 9 is a more mature rocket. Over the years, they have increased the thrust on the Merlin engines, and really, they can't really make the, the Falcon 9 any taller because they're sort of at transportation and structural limits. So the rocket has just got faster and faster coming off the pad. Whereas New Glenn, it is a new rocket. It very much feels like, feels like it's an overbuilt design at this point, and the performance that we're seeing off the pad shows that. I went and I put some numbers into a spreadsheet based upon the telemetry, based upon how fast it was going upwards, and I'm estimating that its thrust to weight ratio is about 1.2, maybe slightly lower, 1.15, and that actually is important to us because it answers a question of what the mass of the booster is when it's fully fueled. We know the engines are 250 tons of thrust each, so if it's got a thrust, if it's got a thrust to weight ratio of about one point two, that suggests that it's about fourteen hundred, maybe fifteen hundred tons fully fueled on the pad. That's half the mass of a Saturn V, and that's mostly fuel in the first stage. Which, by the way, lets it burn that first stage for a whole lot longer than the Falcon Nine, which by this point would have been staged and uh, you know headed downwards. Anyway, we're up to main engine cutout, stage separation, critical moment. At this point, the speed was about 4,755 miles per hour, which is about 7,600 uh, 7, kilometers per hour. That's about 500 kilometers per hour slower than the Falcon 9. The staging is also happening at about 50 kilometers as opposed to 70 kilometers in the Falcon 9. But yes, the question was, would these new BE-3U engines light in space? Yes, they did. We get a successful stage separation. And you can see these small, like, light metal plates blowing off. I think these are, like, stiffener material on the Falcon 9 vacuum engine. You have this big stiffener ring, which is seen to get dropped off. It holds the big, large nozzle, keeps it rigid in flight. In this case, it looks like there's many smaller pieces that are placed around the outside, and those partly get blown off by exhaust gas by the looks of things, which is interesting design decision. And at this point, we kind of lose the video feed, uh, which is not great. But, you know, if you look back to Starship Super Heavy Launch 1 and 2, we did not get much in the way of onboard footage until after the flight. So, you know, put that in perspective that this is still a system they're trying to debug. I hope they have some glorious onboard cameras that they will share in a highlight reel at some point. That would be very nice. But yeah, anyway, at this point, second stage is on its way. The engines have lit. That's the hardest part. They just need to keep burning until the thing reaches orbital velocity and make sure that it's in the correct orbit, and then they have achieved mission success. But the other thing that they wanted to do in this flight, they weren't sure, <laughs> was 
could they land that first stage on the barge? And you see that they have my, marked the landing barge, Jacqueline, off the coast there. And you see the booster, the green highlighted booster, is following a ballistic arc down towards it. Now, presumably at this point, the booster is performing a 180 degree turn to point its, uh, you know, the rear end towards the landing site. It wants to enter with the bottom first because that's where the heat shielding are and that's where the, the engines are. And of course, they also have these big fins up the top and it should keep it aerodynamically stable in that orientation. And of course, all this stuff, by the way, is powered by that auxiliary power unit, that thing that caused problems on the first flight a few days ago. Uh, that is needed to run the you know the fins and the landing legs and stuff. But uh, during all this, we did actually have some good commentary from the control room. There was all the main commentators screaming and shouting over the top, but there was somebody that was definitely knew what he was talking about. I could tell because he was using metric. And most of the readouts were basically you know, good chamber pressures on the second stage, good guidance on the second stage, and then a countdown for the first stage, which was falling towards the atmosphere, towards that moment where it would perform the uh, atmosphere entry burn. This is partly to slow the vehicle down by firing the engines, but also the exhaust that comes out essentially envelops the spacecraft and it breaks apart some of those hard shock waves that can basically act like plasma knives cutting into your, uh, your structure. They would like to not have to do this on future flights, but for this one, they were being extra careful. They're exploring landing, so they were want to take it easy. Let's be clear that while SpaceX has been doing this for hundreds of flights and it seems almost passe, Blue Origin also have a lot of experience in landing boosters, but their experience is all in the final few seconds, the touchdown on the pad. Entering into the atmosphere at high Mach speeds is something that uh, they, is, is new territory for them. And this is what they're exploring and what they're trying to learn about. And no rocket company, by the way, has successfully recovered a booster on its first flight, although the space shuttle boosters were recovered from their first flight. And at this point, well, things don't go according to their plan. Interestingly, the guy in the background, he doesn't say anything about engines lighting on the first stage GS1, but the announcer out front, she proudly proclaims all three engines lit and there's no evidence of this in the stream at this point. So it's not clear exactly what happened, but we do actually get a few seconds, a fragment of video from this booster showing what looks like an engine relight. However, we do see a velocity reduction begin to happen in the telemetry. It's not much, and then a few seconds into this, it just stops, right? So what happens? We lose telemetry at this point, we lose video. Is this loss of telemetry because the booster catastrophically fails at this point and becomes a whole bunch of debris falling towards the surface? Or is this just a, an elect a fault which means the booster is no longer stable enough, no longer able to maintain communications with the, you know, the spacecraft in orbit. Is it just moving too fast and too hot? We don't know. Hypersonic retropropulsion is one of those things that really only SpaceX have demonstrated, and they've done it quite a few times, both with Falcon 9 and with Starship. If I were to make an educated guess as myself, right, as someone, I'm not a rocket scientist, I only play one on the internet. I think that you know one of the hard parts is the booster has gone through a uh, section where it is entirely in microgravity and the propellant needs to be settled. We saw that the engines appear to be lit. We saw a small amount of thrust before we lost the telemetry. And I think the deceleration that we saw was not consistent with the atmospheric density at that altitude. So I think the engines definitely lit but they may have had some issue that was related to propellant being fed to the engines, which could have resulted in an RUD in the engines, or the, the engines could have just shut off. But, you know, the engines aren't the only thing that's being fed fuel. If you look, the APU, it also gets propellant, and it might have had an issue transitioning from microgravity back to gravity. That could explain a sudden loss of telemetry and control. I really want to know more on this, but uh, it'll be up to Blue Origin to do their internal investigation and let us know. And frankly, because it's not part of the spacecraft that's going into orbit, they might choose to keep a lot of the details of this secret. But what really matters for Blue Origin is that upper stage. That's the thing that's carrying their admittedly small payload. And it continues to operate successfully 
We get great callouts for the engine performance all the way through, great callouts for the guidance. And after what seems like an eternity, because this is a hydrogen engine that is very efficient, this is something that sips fuel, it eventually shuts down the engine in a 100 mile orbit. And at this point, you know, they celebrate and the mission isn't over, but they have achieved orbit. And that is sort of like the baseline for if you want to get stuff into low Earth orbit. But to do the more complex missions, such as Escapade, they are going to need to relight the engines. And the broadcast actually ended before we got to see a relight happen. And frankly, I was exhausted. But we did get confirmation uh, in the middle of the night that they did, in fact, successfully relight the BE-3U engines. And the blue ring payload attached to the upper stage made it into its final orbit in medium Earth orbit. So they've demonstrated on-orbit, you know, relight capability, which means that they can go into interplanetary space. They can launch NASA's escapade if they're ready to go. Because NASA doesn't care about recovering the booster, they care about their spacecraft going on to Mars. Blue Origin were, however, all in on reusability even before SpaceX started doing it. And they're going to have to look at re-engineering their booster. They're going to have to know why this landing failed and what they can do to prevent it. And they're going to have to look at re-engineering that first booster because, yes, it did take off successfully, but it did appear to be moving very slowly. And it looks like they do they could actually use a bit more performance on that. A big part of it is that it is so tall, it makes it look like it's moving more slowly. But even when you, you add the numbers, it does appear to have taken off more slowly than most other commercial rockets, with one very obvious exception. It seems to me that with seven engines, if they lost one engine, they would be very much in a similar state. And some people have pointed to LinkedIn postings suggesting that there may be a nine-engine version of New Glenn coming down the pipeline. They probably lost a fair amount of Delta V to gravity losses. Alternatively, I think that there's probably a lot of room to make those engines more powerful. They're running at relatively low chamber pressure. I think they can probably learn to understand the rocket structure and cut back on that. They have a lot of room to grow with this. This is the version 1 of the product. And if you look at version 1 of the Falcon 9, it is a lot less capable than what we fly today. But finally, I kind of want to roll back to... Uh, the moment just before launch, because one of the best things about this was they had really good audio from the pad. So listen for the turbine whine as the APU spins up. APU's running. T minus 30 seconds. GS1 at flight level. GS2 at play level. Big water start. And yes, the acronym for Blue Origin New Glen is B O N G. That is uh, bong water. And it's about to get lit. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, two, 1. Lift off. All seven engines have full thrust. Chain for pressures are good. Vehicles cleared the tower. Now passing 18 seconds into flight. That was awesome. Blue Origin, welcome to the club. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.